Hello, I am back, finally. It's been a year since I did my last vegan video, so I feel like enough time has passed for me to do another one. If you haven't seen my last video on it, don't worry. Basically, I just give my viewpoint on veganism. The fact that I see it as a philosophy that seeks to reduce the consumption and use of animal products to the greatest degree that one reasonably can. Essentially, my viewpoint was that there are fringe scenarios in which vegans can eat meat or do things that would otherwise generally not be considered vegan. I think at least I haven't rewatched it, but in my completely unbiased opinion, you definitely should. Especially if me saying a person can feasibly consume consume animal products and still be considered vegan is something that enrages or confuses you. Anyway, in the comments of my last video, a lot of people were talking about lab-grown meat. That's what they thought the video was going to be about. But the thing is that lab-grown meat, at least in its current form, isn't really vegan at all. First off, let's talk about what lab-grown meat actually is. For one thing, it's usually called cultured meat in a scientific context. The concept is pretty simple. Meat is mostly muscle cells, and right now the easiest way to get those muscle cells is to grow them in an animal. Unfortunately, to get the meat, you need to kill said animal, and that's where the problem is. The trick with cultured meat is getting those cells to grow outside of an animal's body. That way, when you want to harvest them to get your meat, you don't need to kill an animal and chop it up. You just need to shape your cells into a steak or a burger or whatever. The process is relatively straightforward, but that's not to say that it's not tricky. Mammalian cells are really tough to grow in a lab because they're used to growing as part of a whole body. So this is a super simplified run through of what you need to do. To start, you need cells. You can't just get them from nothing. You need to take them from an animal. So your options are to either biopsy an adult or harvest an embryo. Once you've got your cells, you need to treat them so that they're ready to be grown. Essentially, you need stem cells, the kind of cells that can turn into pretty much any kind of cell because they haven't decided what kind of cell they're going to be yet. Once you've got your stem cells, you just chuck them in a big vat and make them multiply. You need to add a growth medium to that vat, basically a solid or liquid for the cells to grow in that contains all of the nutrients that they need to grow. And one really common thing to use in those growth media is fetal bovine serum, basically the blood of unborn baby cows. And once they've grown in number, you need to nudge them into being the right kind of cells that you're looking for, in this case, muscle cells. But that's not all. Meat is more than just a lump of cells. The structure is important, and that's where scaffolds come in. Scaffolds essentially guide the cells into forming the appropriate structure, one that's similar to that of meat. And you can even make them edible so you don't need to remove them at the end. And that's essentially how you make cultured meat. Now, there are a lot of hurdles that I haven't mentioned, and it is a little more complicated than that, but those are the basic steps that you need to know. Now, you've probably already noticed two major non vegan parts of this namely, the harvesting of the cells and the use of FBS, the cow's blood, in growing the cells. Right now, from what I've read, we'd likely still need to have animals grown in farms so we could harvest their cells for lab-grown meat. However, the relative harm to each animal per portion of meat would decrease drastically. Other issues here beyond animal welfare are the cost and environmental impact. Both could still be relatively high if we had to grow animals for biopsies. Granted, the environmental impact would be reduced massively in comparison to the current state of farming, but it is still a consideration. One potential solution for this is creating an immortal cell line that we can continually use to produce meat instead of taking biopsies. Now, you might have already heard of immortal cell lines. We already have immortal mammalian cell lines that we use in research, namely HeLa cells, which I've got a full video on over on my podcast. An immortal cell line is pretty much just one that we can keep going indefinitely in the lab. Most cells have a limit to the number of times that they can divide Divide, but immortal cell lines can basically just go on forever. So the potential exists to get rid of the farming element of cultured meat, but we're not quite there yet. As for FBS, it's generally considered as a byproduct of the dairy industry. While you're slaughtering the mother, you just take out the fetus, kill that, and steal its blood. <laughs> So it's really, really dark. This does mean that it's convenient and there's a ready supply. However, the price has been going up so much because the demand is so high. Which is kind of good and bad news. The bad news being that cultured meat is still tied to the meat industry and so scaling up would mean that many animals had to be slaughtered. And the relative benefit of not killing as many cows for their meat is kind of hampered by the number of cows we'd need to kill for their blood. The good news is that this high cost means that there is a huge incentive to find a better alternative. And if said alternative is cheaper and vegan, then we'd be in a really good position. However, that is easier said than done because it's all well and good to do that at a laboratory scale, but when you manage to scale up to mass production, there are many more hoops that need to be jumped through. So yeah, cultured meat isn't really vegan yet, but do we absolutely need to solve all of those problems before selling it to the public? Honestly, I don't think so. Look, as I said at the top of this video, I think that veganism should be about reducing the use and consumption of animal products to the greatest degree one reasonably can. Now, obviously not eating meat at all would be the best option here, but it is entirely 
unrealistic to expect the entire world to immediately stop eating meat in favor of tofu and seitan. I think this is a stepping stone, not an end point. Many people just don't want to stop eating meat and offering a substitute that reduces the amount of animal suffering by any degree is a good thing. I don't really see cultured meat as a solution for vegans. We're generally all right with our mycoprotein legumes, yeast, and wheat proteins. Cultured meat is a solution for meat eaters. It's a way to get them on board with reducing the harm that the meat industry causes to animals and the planet. It's kind of like the Impossible Whopper and Great Imitator Wrap. They're primarily plant-based, but not vegan for some reason or another. Ideally, I'd want them to be suitable for vegans, and to be honest, I think it's kind of ridiculous that they didn't put in the extra effort to make them that, but it's still a good thing to give meat eaters a plant-based option. And realistically, vegans shouldn't even be eating at places like Burger King or Nando's anyway, even if they have vegan options, because you're still supporting a company whose primary source of income is the exploitation of animals. Regardless though, for non-vegans, these baby steps are what some people need. Not everyone can make the leap. Some people need stepping stones. Before I went vegan, I was vegetarian for a few years and I explicitly remember saying, I could never go vegan. And before that I ate meat and I thought I could never go vegetarian. I proved myself wrong and f***ed up a lot along the way. It ended up taking me about eight or nine months to fully go vegan and it wasn't easy at all. And I think it would have been a lot harder if I hadn't been vegetarian for three years beforehand. What I think a lot of people don't get about being vegan is that it's not inherently hard. Okay, a lot of places don't cater to vegans, but that doesn't mean that catering to a vegan diet is inherently difficult. The reason it seems so hard is because we've all been raised in a world where consuming animal products is the norm. Drinking cow's milk is totally normal. Eating meat is totally normal and eating eggs is totally normal. But once you've been vegan for a while, you start to move out of that mindset. You stop seeing all the things you can't have and start to see all the things that you can. There are a lot of foods that meat eaters will tend to ignore or not fully explore, because they see meat as the center of their diet. You stop thinking that a meal is incomplete without meat and start to see that it's not really necessary. Our culture puts such a focus on animal products, we think that they're really incredibly important in cooking and completely irreplaceable. But honestly, I think that oat milk tastes better than cow's milk. I don't think you can tell the difference between a lot of vegan and non-vegan baked goods. And when it comes to vegan substitutes for processed meat, they're pretty bloody similar because the taste and texture that you enjoy in your fish fingers and chicken nuggets don't really come from the meat in them. When it comes to substitutes for unprocessed meat, honestly, I can't remember what meat tastes like. So it's not like I'm sitting there worrying about how similar the substitutes are. I like them in their own right because not everything needs to be judged or enjoyed as a facsimile of meat. But you don't start at that point. You get there over time. Some people need more time than others. And yeah, I think if you can make something vegan, you should. Like the Impossible Whopper, it shouldn't really be that hard. But not making it vegan isn't inherently a bad thing. It's not perfect, but it's a first step. And I'm not talking about the companies necessarily, I'm talking about the consumers, who never would have thought that they could reduce their meat intake without it being really inconvenient and unenjoyable. I think that anything that puts someone on the path to being vegan is a good thing. It can't always just be going cold turkey. Sometimes it can start with just one small substitution. Before someone can truly embrace a vegan lifestyle, they need to feel like it's accessible and achievable. You don't train for a marathon by immediately running 42K. You build it up slowly over time. Here's the thing that I feel like so many vegans seem to miss. Any degree of veganism is a good thing. Honestly, if your goal is to harass everyone into being perfect, then you're gonna fail. You should be focusing on changing people's mindset, making them realize that vegan choices are easy to make. Switching to plant milk, reducing your red meat intake, eating vegan at home a couple nights a week, going vegetarian or even going pescatarian. All of these choices are good choices. They're not perfect, but that's not what's important. What is important is that people are making better choices. 100 imperfect vegans is far better than one perfect vegan. I know you care about the environment. I know you care about animal welfare, but if your goals are unrealistic, you're only going to alienate the people that you want to have on your side. That's not even to mention the fact that literally no one is a perfect vegan. I went over this in my last video. Unless you are living in a completely controlled environment, growing your own food, some harm is still going to come to other living creatures 
through your lifestyle. I'm not saying this to undermine veganism and I'm not saying that it's pointless. My point is that you cannot remove all harm from the planet, not completely. That's why the goal is to reduce it to as low a level as is feasible. I think this comes down to what you think the best tactic for making someone vegan is. Right now, the prevailing method is guilt, showing people the gruesome reality of how we treat animals. For some people, that is enough to make them vegan for life. But humans are good at compartmentalizing. We can convince ourselves that something bad is something good so long as it benefits us. We know about the working conditions in Amazon warehouses. We've heard about the labor violations in iPhone factories and we're all aware of the sweatshops that many clothing brands use, but we ignore it. If we're forced to see it, we forget it. I think the guilt as motivation misses something. Often it positions veganism as a morally superior sacrifice that must be made in order to ensure the well-being of animals. But some people just don't care enough. Other people don't value animal lives remotely similarly to the way they value human ones. And other people still will inevitably cave and eat meat or eggs or milk despite the guilt. Many people are comfortable with eating meat. And not just because they're unaware that animals are being killed or mistreated. I'm sure that a lot of people would recognize that eating meat is at least a little bit morally icky, but they see being vegetarian or vegan as an inconvenience. More of an inconvenience than the guilt of eating meat. The guilt tactic tries to solve this problem by increasing the bad feeling you get from eating animal products. By bombarding people with the gruesome reality of the situation, they hope to make meat seem so awful that no one can bear to eat it. Make the inconvenience of guilt outweigh the inconvenience of removing animal products from your diet. Don't get me wrong, I think that guilt can be really useful, but I don't think it's the whole story. I don't even think that it should be the main focus. The issue isn't that people don't feel guilty enough about eating meat. The issue is that they see that living without meat as more of an inconvenience than it really is. You shouldn't be trying to increase the bad feeling. You should be breaking down the barriers that stop people from being vegan. The fundamental failure here is that not enough people are leading by example. Not enough people are just showing that being vegan can be easy. There are too many people that are pompous. There are too many people that are perpetuating the stereotype of a crazy militant vegan. That isn't going to change enough minds. That isn't going to make veganism seem reasonable or acceptable. Making people feel bad is not going to make them want to support you. Understanding the animal abuse caused by the meat industry is important, but it's incomplete without a clear and easy path towards veganism. Imperfect solutions like the Impossible Whopper, the Great Imitator Wrap, or Cultured Meat help make that journey easier. The small changes lead to bigger changes down the line. Sure, there are people I know that have watched documentaries and gone vegan, but I don't think I've seen that work on anyone that has a strong attachment to meat. For the people that I know that have been really into meat, including myself by the way, the way that I've seen them change is by other people showing them that veganism doesn't need to be perfect, that it can be easy, and helping them to understand that the meat-centric mindset that they've been conditioned into is actually more limiting than veganism. Showing people that cooking can be more fun and more creative when you don't need to center every single meal around a slab of meat. Showing people that vegan foods taste good in their own right and don't need to be seen solely as substitutes for animal products. If someone's veganism is motivated by guilt, then I think it's far easier for them to mess up and fall back into eating animal products. Guilt as a sole motivator almost ensures that someone still sees meat as desirable, as a guilty pleasure, as a comfort food, and sees their lifestyle as some second tier consolation prize. So if you're vegan, what can you do? Make sure that people understand the harm that the meat industry causes to the environment and to animals, but also make sure that you present veganism not as some unfortunate moral consequence, but as no less difficult or enjoyable than eating meat. Remember, the reason that meat-based diets seem so much easier to cater to and live with is not because veganism is inherently more difficult. It's because you've spent your entire life learning about nutrition from a meat-based standpoint. Going vegan essentially means relearning how to build recipes and cook meals. But once you've done that, it is no harder than a diet that contains animal products. Once that initial hurdle has been surpassed, you almost forget about it entirely. And that's something I think that no one knows going into veganism. It can feel so, so difficult at the beginning and you think that's how it's gonna be forever, but it isn't. No one really explains that to you. That's why baby steps can be so important. You can rely on animal products in some parts of your life while you get to grips with removing them. So if you want to be a good vegan and make more people vegan, you just need to support them when it's really difficult and let them make mistakes. Don't make them feel bad for still using animal products. Make them feel good for being vegan. To bring it back to the original question of cultured meat being vegan, no, it currently isn't. And technically it never really can be because somewhere down the line, you have to take a biopsy from an animal. 
But I don't think that's very important. If we solve the FBS issue, if we find a way to feed so much of humanity for decades to come by only mildly inconveniencing a few cows with a biopsy, that is fine by me. And if you disagree with that, I really think you need to reassess why you're vegan. Like I said earlier, you cannot completely eliminate harm from the planet. No vegan lives without harming other living things. No one is a perfect vegan. Saying that you absolutely wouldn't support that kind of thing out of principle seems really odd to me because it is the most feasible way we have of eliminating the current meat industry. And that should be the goal of vegans right now. And a major part of that is allowing people to be imperfect vegans and help them on their journey to being better. Ultimately, I see veganism as just one part of a more green environmentalist worldview. I don't expect everyone to shop entirely waste-free or forgo all animal products or recycle every single item. I just hope that people do what they can with the goal of improving as much as they can. I am not perfect by any means, but I want to find areas that I can improve and work on those. And I think that's all you can ask of anyone. And that's what I think about vegans for this year. Thank you for watching this video. If you watched it this far and enjoyed it, then you should probably subscribe. And also have a look at my Patreon, please. And thank you, by the way, to my patrons, all of them, but especially to Big Willy and Sarah. If you want to watch more videos on veganism, my friend Jamie did one the other week that you should check out. And also That Queer Kiwi did a couple of few weeks ago that you should check out. And also, we did an episode of my podcast on lab-grown meat, which you should also check out. Also, I have merch like this frog beanie and a lot of other things that you should check out. The link is in the description. I think that's enough shameless plugging for one. Day, so goodbye!